8,000 feet up in the rainforests of Zaire, a man called Adrian de Schreiber searches for the animals who have become his driving force in life, as well as his constant companions. The creatures he seeks are the ones that man finds possibly the most imposing on Earth. The reason is obvious. They so closely resemble himself. They're extremely shy, and the dense undergrowth in which they live makes observation appallingly difficult. They can also be extremely intimidating, though aggressiveness is not in their true nature. Come, 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 come. De Shriver was one of the first people in Africa to get gorillas to accept him. It took him four years, and even then, some of the adult males still charged him. Do calme, Casimir. Do calme. Do calme, Casimir. Assez. This is the story of a remarkable man and his fight to protect one of the rarest animals on earth, the gorilla. Adrian de Schreiber stands firm when faced with the charge of a fully grown male gorilla. This is because he understands not only gorillas in general, but this particular animal. The gorilla's nature is very much at odds with its popular image. The strip cartoon has portrayed it as a bloodthirsty creature who embodies the evil side of man's own nature. The horror aspect was emphasized by King Kong and later by the monster called Conga. <laughs> Both Kong and Conga were about 30 feet tall, and though they had a kindly side to them, they were essentially horrific. Legends apart, this great ape always fascinates man by constantly reminding him of his own primeval origins. The gorilla is astonishingly human looking. Everything written about its great strength is true. The muscles that can snap a four-inch bamboo like a twig could also break a man's leg. The gorilla does beat its breast, though not for the reasons usually ascribed to it. The males put on one of the most terrifying demonstrations in the animal kingdom, but only when they feel threatened. All this is only part of the story. Until recently, very little has been known of the other, gentler, family side of the gorilla's life, largely because of the difficulty of studying these peaceful vegetarians in the inaccessible forests in which they live. The vast nation of Zaire, the former Congo, in central Africa, contain small, isolated pockets in which live the few thousand remaining mountain and lowland gorillas. They're scattered over an area 300 miles by 200 miles wide, including the Virunga volcanoes to the northeast. Adrian de Shriver's group exists in the mountains to the northwest of Bukavu on the Rwanda-Zaire border. The twin peaks of Kahuzi and Biega tower above Lake Kivu in the western Rift Valley. The peaks themselves are bare volcanic rock, their lower slopes heavily forested. This is the habitat for the largest of the great apes.
The forests are humid and rich in the herbs and vines gorillas prefer. The forests start at around 6,000 feet. Below that, the fertile land has been cleared for cultivation. Once inside the trees, you're in the world of the rainforest. It's lush, dark, and smells richly of wet earth and forest herbs. Only the hum of insects and the cry of an occasional turaco breaks the silence. Concealed in the 230 square miles of Kahuzi Biega National Park are perhaps 250 gorillas, some of the last of their species. The world they inhabit beneath the canopy of the trees is one of undisturbed, primordial peace. Adrian de Shriver, sometime hunter, survivor of a bloody civil war, is best described as a man of peace, even though one violent part of his life made him otherwise. A Belgian with plantations on the slopes of Mount Kahuzi, he survived the terrible Congo fighting of the early 1960s, though he saw his farm and home burnt to the ground. De Shriver is a man of great gentleness and few words. He is also a man of deadly action when necessary. During the fighting, he evacuated his family safely across Lake Kivu by dugout canoe. At one point, he captured 300 raiding Simba rebels single-handed with a jeep and heavy machine gun. But none of this saved his property from destruction. When peace returned to Zaire in 1965, De Shriver had had enough of violence and killing to last several lifetimes. All he wanted to do was to preserve the peace of the forests around his property and above all, the peace of the gorillas who were lords of that forest. As a former hunter, he knew the value of local trackers. He knew, too, that these trackers had previously been the most successful guerrilla poachers. So on the principle that the best poachers make the best gamekeepers, he enlisted their help in trying to make contact with at least some of the guerrilla groups. They kept at it day after day, learning a little more each time about the movements and habits of the gorilla families. This initial phase took De Shriver nearly four years. At the end of that time, one or two families seemed willing to let him approach and study them, though they were still very shy of revealing themselves in the open. One trick that he adopted early on was that to reassure a gorilla that you meant him no harm, you ate whatever the gorilla was eating. De Shriver believes that an eating gorilla is one that comes in peace. As far as the gorillas are concerned, the same apparently goes for their distant relative. De Shriver has begun to understand the ways of the gorilla and freely studies the daily lives of several families and one family in particular, 
the one dominated by a superb silver-backed male whom he calls Casimir. We meet Casimir as he is making up his mind to cross a road that cuts through the park. De Shriver waits silently with his chief trackers, Mushiberi and Pili Pili. He's been able to anticipate Casimir's intentions, but now he talks to him by way of reassurance. Come, 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 come. Come, 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 come. Gorillas don't like the trackers, perhaps because they associate them with earlier hunting. And the trackers don't much care for gorillas either. When they are close, the trackers always sit well behind Adrian. Come, 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 come. Casimir is responsible for the safety of his family, so he's understandably cautious about crossing a road that has recently been made through his home range. Casimir comes out first and stands guard all 450 pounds of him. Then come the females and the young. The first three are safely up the bank on the far side. Next, a mother and two young. Satisfied that the coast is clear, Casimir is content to hand over guard duty to his subordinate males. The second female crossing is called Broken Arm. Finally, the rear guard, the second rank males. First, Hannibal. Then a gorilla named after a tracker whose mouth is always open, Musharamena. Casimir takes his family of 19 up the bank to be swallowed by the forest once more. It is Casimir's family with whom de Shriver has a close day-to-day -day relationship. A gorilla's day starts just after dawn. The whole day is governed by the need to eat. Cahuzi Biega provides rich feeding, much of it at ground level. The smaller animals, the young males, females and infants, sometimes spend their nights in the trees, building well-made nests there. The larger animals build their nests on the ground. The senior male, Casimir, leads the family from the nest site. He knows the general direction he intends to take them in search of food. During the day, they'll cover anything up to two miles, seldom more. When gorillas are traveling, they move in single file. The trail will be harder to follow later when they spread out to feed. There are rotten logs to be crossed, giant nettles to be avoided, vines and creepers to be cut and parted. Sometimes the approach takes hours, even though torn shoots and nibbled leaves show that the gorillas are only a short distance ahead. Until they're close, Mushaberi leads, cutting a trail with his panga. Often the gorillas are heard long before they're seen. If they are uneasy, they often beat their breasts.
The noise is made by hitting the cupped hand on the chest. It's not aggression, as many people suppose, but a gorilla's way of releasing tension, like scratching a head or lighting up a cigarette. If they're feeding on a banana tree, the sound of tearing leaves can be heard hundreds of yards away. The entire family may spend up to half an hour disposing of this single tree. It's only one item on the menu in a 12-hour day, most of which will be spent eating, eating, eating. It's been estimated that an adult male gorilla disposes of 60 pounds of food, all vegetable matter, every single day of his life. By the time Casimir decides to move on, there's very little of the banana tree left. De Shriver maintains that Casimir is an excellent conservationist. His family seems to wreck only one banana tree at a time. As Mushaberry and De Shriver follow once more, they pass the remains of Casimir's previous banana tree meals. A third tree has been left untouched for the future. Gorillas are highly selective feeders. They appear to know just what plants they want at any given time of the day and season. They have a large selection to choose from. A list of over 200 food plants has already been compiled. Next on this day's menu is a clinging weed called galium or bed straw. Once again using his eating mind to approach Casimir, De Shriver studies the great ape's technique for dealing with this troublesome weed. The leaves of gallium are armed with little hooks which make it difficult to handle. To get around this minor inconvenience, Casimir rolls it up before swallowing. After years of contact, it appears that Casimir actually likes to meet the Shriver, but always chooses an open space in which to do so. In the open, he no longer charges him. Just the same, the Shriver often takes ten minutes of a cautious, step-by-step -step approach to get as close as this. Hannibal is number three male, not yet silverbacked. You can always recognize him by his downturned mouth. He's an inquisitive animal, and as time went on, De Shriver was able to approach him even more closely than Casimir. What follows is an incredible scene, because this time it seems to be Hannibal who wishes to make contact with De Shriver, despite the gorilla's initial diffidence. De Shriver senses that something unusual is in the air. Hannibal is reassured and settles down again, only feet away.
But the Shriver is still certain something is going to happen, and suddenly it does. Was this an aggressive move or a desire to make contact? The blow from the huge left fist never actually landed. The right hand simply pulled out the shirt. Hannibal has never tried to repeat that performance. Possibly once was enough for him. It certainly was for De Shriver. Peace reigns over the forest. The sound of crashing branches and rending leaves stops. During this siesta period, the gorillas groom and relax. Towards the end of the midday break, there's sometimes a disturbance. The youngsters grow restless. With the indulgence of their seniors, they take part in play fights. The midday halt is the only time they can do this without getting left behind by the constantly moving family. De Shriver's field craft and knowledge of gorilla habits often enables him to anticipate the next stopping place along their intended route, and he waits for them there. They climb up into the trees for their first feed of the afternoon. What they're after is a parasitic plant, rather like mistletoe. Previous observation of gorillas in more open country had suggested that they were cautious and rather clumsy climbers. In the forests of Kahuzi, where there are plenty of large trees to bear their weight, they show themselves to be extraordinarily agile. They move on again. There are still three good feeding hours left. Their chosen route is taking them towards the edge of the park where the trees end and the farmland begins. Casimir has a definite objective in mind. It's very rarely that the whole group emerges into the open together. On a track at the border of the park, the family reveals itself.
The young male, Fred, escorts a female. The difference in size is very evident. The males, besides being much bigger, have a flatter face and a higher peaked forehead. Fred is probably seven or eight. This female looks pregnant, in which case she's probably carrying Casimir's infant. Casimir has first choice of receptive females. Though Casimir is over 20, he's still very much in command of the group. His stately exit tells the youngsters and more timid females that it's safe to cross the track. Any quarrelling in a gorilla group is usually among the females. Males take little notice. They prefer to eat in silence. Gorillas do a good deal of barking as a warning or to appear aggressive. Sometimes they give a questioning bark as if to ask, who's there? Now Hannibal and Musha Romena marshal the rest of the family to hurry on in the general direction which Casimir has indicated. The final objective is now reached. A wild fruit called a bwamba is ripe for the gathering. When the Bwamba season comes, guerrilla groups make their way to certain well-known Bwamba trees and pillage the ripe fruits. First, the fruit that has fallen to the ground. Then Casimir leads the assault to the topmost branches. Musharamena follows next. And then come the females and younger males. A youngster beats the branches, though it's hard to say why. Possibly in play. The Bwamba feast is over for the day, and when the family finally climbs down, each member has his mouth stuffed full of the fruit.
The gorillas seldom leave the forest or trespass on the farmland. When they do so, it brings them in contact with the chief danger to their future. This particular subsistence farmer is no direct threat to them at the moment, but these have always been his fields. As long as trees are felled and forests cleared, the gorillas will be on the retreat. Now it's the African farmer who beats a retreat. Minus his hat. The gorilla family continues unperturbed to find a resting place at the end of their day. A farmer's hat becomes an object of brief curiosity. After considerable scrutiny, they discard it, possibly because it's one of the few pieces of vegetable matter they've met with all that day that is no good to eat. Casimir doesn't even deign to look at it as he and his family move away to a night's rest in the forest. In 1970, the farmer's limits were clearly defined by this vital piece of paper. This is the letter that justified all Adrian de Shriver's efforts. President Mobutu of Zaire designated the Kahuzi Biega Forest a national park for gorillas. President Mobutu has, moreover, declared that up to 15% of his country will eventually become national parks. So the omens for the Kahuzi Biega gorillas are good although the local situation continually needs watching. At many points, tea and coffee plantations march alongside the forest. Just beyond, more trees have been felled that were once all part of the gorilla's range. It's a situation which the farmers are always going to try to push to the limit. On this particular boundary, encroachment has been stopped, but the process of erosion goes on elsewhere. In the few places gorillas still exist, they're continually being pushed back. Even close to park headquarters, De Shriver had problems with intruding cattle. He gave the villagers three warnings to get their cows out of the forest, and when this failed, acting on direct orders, he shot quite a few head. His trackers, who had lost their traditional hunting grounds in the park, had a feast. Such encroachment is understandable, but if it is not checked, there would soon be a thousand or more cattle trampling and eating the vegetation which the gorillas need for their survival, and their range would become even smaller. The point was eventually taken, and the locals removed their cows, at least for the moment. Poaching gorillas for food in the remotest parts of the forest is a constant threat. De Shriver had authority to shoot poachers, though he never had to do so, even though his own brother was killed by a poacher's bullet intended for him. But there is a tender side to Adrian De Shriver's nature that is far from being sentimental. This baby gorilla's parents were killed by poachers. Some farmers had adopted her. As warden of Kahuzi Biega Park, De Shriver had authority over all gorillas in Zaire, including orphans. So he flew his own aircraft to visit the farmers who had adopted this one. He persuaded them that they must give up the young gorilla. There are so few gorillas left in the wild that it was De Shriver's duty someday to try to return this baby to the wild state. At the time, he had no idea how or when, and could not have begun to guess how the story would end. As a start, he took the tiny gorilla back with him to his house at Bukavu, with the idea of teaching her some of the skills she'd need in the wild. Julie, the nearest European equivalent to the Swahili word ngila, for gorilla, was encouraged to play with his own children. 
This was a not entirely successful lesson in breastfeeding. To a young gorilla, a bicycle offers the same sort of gymnastic opportunities as a young tree. You can cling and you can swing. Adrian introduced her to the sort of companions she might eventually meet if he ever succeeded in releasing her into the wild, like this three-horned chameleon. But there was no previous record of an orphan being successfully adopted by a wild gorilla family. So we agree. Gorillas have very little use for water. They obtain all the liquid they need from the plants they eat. And they certainly never wash. Grooming keeps their hair clean. But there were no gorilla adults to groom Julie, so occasionally she had to endure a bath. Gorillas are not known to swim. One of the things that helps to limit their natural range is their inability to cross large rivers. For an animal with this sort of aversion to water, Julie was surprisingly cooperative. She was now about six months old. Up to six months, young gorillas progress faster than humans. De Shriver had no illusions about the choice that lay ahead. Confinement in a zoo, or the unknown hazards of confrontation with wild relatives. Young gorillas will continue to suckle up to 18 months, longer if they're given the chance. De Shriver got his wife to bottle feed Julie. But it would be too much of a risk to hope that some lactating female would adopt her if and when she ever returned to the forest. It's easy to get a young mammal to accept bottle feeding, but far more difficult to wean it onto solids. And this had to be done as soon as possible. Meantime, while Julie grew in strength, De Shriver's daily observations of gorilla behavior in the forest continued. It was the rainy season, and now the gorillas had left the Bwamba trees on the border of the park and climbed high into the bamboo forests that begin at 7,500 feet. The bamboos provide them with a great deal of protein at this time of year. For some reason, the gorillas become more aggressive and less approachable in the dense bamboo woodlands.
Julie was constantly on de Shriver's mind. One of the things taxing him was at what age, if ever, he should try to return her to the forest. She could hardly hope to look after herself under 18 months old. Above all, she had to keep learning. So he started carrying her into the forest to get used to its sights, sounds and smells. He began to show her wild foods, such as choice banana leaves. At first, she didn't seem very keen, but gradually she began to chew on them. It was another great step forward. As foster parent, de Shriver next persuaded her to crawl with him, just as she would with her mother when roaming through the forest. She looked to him constantly for guidance. De Shriver confesses he became completely captivated by her, though he remained realistic about her future. It was no good becoming too attached to Julie. As warden, he was committed to returning her to the wild. The question was, when? De Shriver had no intention of trying to reintroduce her too soon. He was prepared to wait years if necessary. The forest was far too intimidating and the behavior of gorillas too uncertain to take any chances. What now follows was completely unplanned. One day, De Shriver decided to take Julie close to Casimir's family to let her hear and become used to the sounds of wild gorillas. Hannibal was very close and obviously agitated. Now, unexpectedly, Julie started to cry. Even de Shriver began to get alarmed. There was no way he could retreat. The gorillas were all around him. In a situation like this, the group would look to Casimir for a lead. Suddenly they got it. Casimir, Casimir, calm. Attention, Casimir, calm, Casimir. Casimir. Casimir stopped in the open space where the rest of the family waited to inspect and fondle her. <laughs> Casimir reappeared briefly to assert his dominance over de Shriver, whom he may well regard as a rival. De Shriver admitted afterwards that he only dropped Julie on the ground because he expected to be killed by Casimir. The whole kidnapping happened so quickly that it's only possible to see it when the details are slowed up.
Casimir scoops Julie up, carries her away, and then suddenly drops her. De Shriver starts forward as if to try to recover her, but Casimir, who has never once taken his eyes off him, charges once again. This time he successfully picks Julie up out of the undergrowth. It was perhaps a tragedy that Casimir took matters into his own hands and kidnapped Julie. Alas, unprecedented rain and cold struck the mountains and she lived for only ten days. Had there been a nursing female in the group who could have breastfed her, she might very well have survived. But the one thing that has been proved is that wild gorillas will accept orphaned young. In creating Kahuzi Biega National Park, the Republic of Zaire has undoubtedly saved one of the largest remaining populations of gorillas. Adrian de Shriver is convinced that other neighboring forest areas are also inhabited by the great apes he has made his daily companions. Since this film was made, several new gorilla groups have been discovered. De Shriver has now handed over control of the park to a new Zairean warden. But it was the man's complete dedication to the Kahuzi Biega and its gorillas that has made it the great success it undoubtedly is today.